Lifestyle Pirates with Big J and Adriano. Good morning, Squire. How are you? I'm all right. Not bad. How well, are you doing? I'm very well. We are sitting here on Lifestyle Pirates this morning with David Messam, the winemaker from Born and Raised Wines. Yeah, welcome nice to be here. Thank you, chaps. Thanks for coming in. Now, mate, just a quick, uh, quick congratulations. I was seeing you've won some awards recently. Tell us about those. Yeah, we have actually, which is pretty cool. Um, don't often enter too many competitions, but um, yeah, over in the UK early this year before kind of COVID kicked off, uh, looking for a bit of export, so we entered uh, the London wine competition. Uh, just three wines: the Sauvignon Blanc, uh, the Shiraz, both got silvers. Yep. And, uh, and a goal for the Super Tea, which is our sort of Italian Sangiovese Cab, mm. Mab, Cab Merlot blend. Awesome. Now, we actually have a Sab Blanc here, so we're going to crack that as we go through the show. I hope that's okay. You're, uh, you're, 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 you can have a couple of glasses and drive. I can, have, I can have a cheeky glass. Yeah. Marvellous, marvellous. Now, mate, you're trying to bring Sab Blanc back, really, aren't you? Because it went on a bit of a hiatus. Uh, yeah, that's a really good way to put it, actually. Um, I uh, just, just for the people watching, here's the label. There you go. <laughs> Look at that award-winning label as well. Award-winning. I'd like to put award-winning. <laughs> the wine's crap, but, but the, uh, <laughs> for the label's good. No, it's not. It just got no. a silver. In fact, it was one point off a gold, which means that one one judge couldn't quite be swayed. So uh, that's pretty good. And actually, what's pretty good, interesting about that is this is a um, a skin contact wine. You can kind of see by the colour. Uh, mm. It's kind of much darker. Has that more sort of? I guess you'd probably associate to Chardonnay, mm. slightly more yellowy, um, and that's because yeah, it's kind of left on skins for in this case about six months. Yeah. So it's kind of a. It's more than that sort of natural wine tip. Um, cheers, mate. I got that one. That's fine. Thank you. Salute. Cheers. Um, congratulations. Absolutely. Cheers, gents. Nice to see you both. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of uh, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, a different kind of sort of aspect, I suppose, mm. of it. And what I think is interesting is. When I first started making wine uh, back in 2010, I did a couple of vintages in Marlborough, good old New Zealand. Yep. Uh, huge winery, contract winery. We did lots of really cool stuff. We did things with craggy range and pretty high-end premium yep. stuff. And then some pretty sort of low-level, low, low level, entry-level wines. So I kind of saw literally the Savalanche in full effect. And uh, yeah. Savalanche, we'll have to hashtag that when we put this <laughs> podcast out. Savalanche. The Savalanche, <laughs> yes, that's it. So yeah, we kind of look at that and um, it's a pretty... Uh, amazing sort of feat to see some of that winemaking, really, really big, large scale trucks backed up as far as the eye can see type stuff. But what I loved about it was, you know, we were sort of stealing a little bit of fruit, you know, literally handfuls at a time and chucking them in um, you know, little containers under the press and just letting it ferment wild and doing kind of crazy stuff. And I was like, yeah, there's actually some quite, it has a lot of, a lot of, sort of uh, aspects, I suppose, that you can really sort of play with. So um, that was kind of, I guess, part of the uh, inspiration for doing, doing this one out of Sunbury in Victoria. Very good. And you, we, you said about the Savalanche. Um, Sav Blanc's now kind of coming back on the map. You know, a lot of producers out of Adelaide Hills, you're bringing it back as well. Did people kind of get over that Kiwi textbook, you know, Sav Blanc? Yeah, I think that's that's part of it, that sort of passion fruit pop, kind of, yeah. uh, or, or super grassy, really sort of passion fruit, really, really tropical. Um, I mean, obviously it was kind of brought in with kind of cloudy bay back in – probably 90s, I said. I, I remember working for a wine shop in the UK when I was 18 um, and, uh, yeah, managing to get a couple of bottles of Cloudy Bay, being, you know, super excited by it. Shows you what a wine nerd was, even then. And, um, yeah, that kind of kicked off this this kind of, you know, crazy thing uh, with uh, with Kiwi Savvy. So, yeah, it's, um, it is. But what's interesting is we still – it's pretty much the biggest import into Australia is Kiwi Sav. Really? Yeah, it's massive. We, we drink an absolute ton of the stuff. But it has had a bit of a sort of kickback um, and people sort of going, hmm, you yeah, know, I'm a bit over that now. Mm. What's next? Can you relate that to Kath and Kim? <laughs> no, that'll be Chardonnay, wouldn't that's it? That's Chardonnay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. My bad. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's another one that does has exactly that kind of cultural ramifications, you know, doesn't it? Classic Shardy, which is, you know, that sort of bright golden colour, loads of oak. Mm. And, uh, I do uh, love Chardonnay. Mm. I love Chardonnay. It's great, mm. great wine. But um, interestingly enough, there's still a place for it, you know. Yeah. That's always the thing. There's always a place for, for something. Someone likes it. So what got you into wine? What made you want to be like to dedicate your whole life to wine? Well, not your whole life. <laughs> my whole life. life. <laughs> Sounds a bit sad, doesn't it? Yeah, my whole no, no, life. Not to, at all. To, to <laughs> ferment, <laughs> not at all. To fermented grape juice. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do want, sometimes wonder that actually. Yeah. It's a good, fair point. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just, I've, I've always loved food and, food and booze, to be perfectly yeah. honest. Uh, it's, um, 
uh, it's that sort of generosity. I love hosting people. I love cooking. Uh, it comes from my old man. He's, you know, great cook. Yeah. Um, he's a messy cook. Yeah. As my mum will attest to, but uh, <laughs> yeah. somehow she's, she stayed around to clear up after him, yeah. but he's, he's a good cook. And so, yeah, I guess it was always about that kind of, yeah, yeah. Um, generosity of sort of spirit and getting people around the table and eating and drinking. Mm-hmm. And he used to wine taste. He got into it um, uh, years ago, about 45 years ago now. Uh, and sort of we always have wine around. So mm. he used to drag me around the Loire as a kid, you know, yeah. and uh, getting, getting told off by winemakers saying there's too much sulfur in their wines, all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. And is, is he still in the mix with the, with the wine the wine trade? Um, he's, he's never been professional. It's right. just pure interest. Yeah, yeah. No, there's no sort of huge heritage story here. It's um, <laughs> just a real good love of wine, and yeah. Uh, yeah, he does. He still meets up with his couple of mates that are still knocking about every Wednesday. Yeah, cr- cracks a few bottles, writes notes. Lovely. Yeah. yeah. So that's actually it's, a really good. It's point. pretty cool. What, what's the difference between? Someone that just loves it, and then you know, you said the word professional, but I'm assuming you've you get paid, <laughs> you make money. Um, yeah. I'm assuming you there's qualifications you go through, maybe some you know studying. Like, what what's that journey look like to become a winemaker? Yeah, look, there's a couple of different sort of ways in. Um, and as a winemaker, yeah, that's a particularly interesting one because it, it is very technical. It's the technical sort of side of the wine kind of game. You know, it really does have that chemical analysis, chemistry. Uh, coming into play and I mean classically you go and do a you know a viticultural uh, degree on neology degree um Roseworthy's the, the kind of classic one here in, in Australia um I didn't do that I went through a completely different route and uh, sort of made up as, <laughs> as I went really um but I kind of come from business sort of more marketing and then studied uh, the the Wesset um d- diploma which is the sort of highest level uh that was about 12 years ago okay um, yeah, which is fun for a couple of years. Um, and that sort of gives quite a good sort of basis. And then a lot of it was really just hands-on learning for, for the, for the winemaking part. Yeah. Yeah. And I get the sense it's a real labor of love. You know, it's, it's it, there's not a quick turnaround in this, right? It's, it's like <laughs> minimum 12 months. Yeah. If yeah. you're lucky. <laughs> if you're lucky. <laughs> on, a, on a good day. Honestly, when it comes to, you know, as we were chatting before we got going, uh, I sort of consult for a number of kind of companies and wine regions for sort of in-market act- activations and, and, and activity, uh, both the Loire and, uh, and Provence, uh, Rosé. And um, when you actually look at it from a really solid business viewpoint, mm. it's got to be one of the worst businesses ever devised. You know, the cash flow is appalling. Yeah. Um, we know some very big wineries over in you know, WA, for instance. I won't name the names, but they're very well known. Mm. Great wines, always had great wines. Mm. And uh, they didn't make a, a single bit of profit for eight years. Wow. wow. And you're just like, wow, yeah, okay. So it's pretty it's pretty tough. There's lots of little ways around it. Everyone's looking for a quick buck and there really isn't one. Um, and to be honest, it's only been over – I kicked off Born and Raised my own label in 2012 and it's only really been the last uh, few years, well, probably before COVID, that we started to kind of actually go, yeah, there's a bit of money left over at the end of the year. Wow. And and as you know, as, as COVID being good because more people are staying at home and buying your wine. Not really for myself, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah. We sell most of these into bars and restaurants, so, right. so the on trade, yeah, uh, which of course has been you know, decimated. Yeah. To be perfectly honest, I saw yours actually up at the, the Shangri La up at the. Up oh at the yeah, uh, Matt, I think it is. Is the the, the sum up there? Yeah, yeah, he's he's been a great supporter from yeah. from an early early time. He loved the Nebbiolo. And, yeah, it's good to see. Yeah, yeah. Oh, there you go. You've been uh, dining in high places, mate. Well, it literally is a high place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, truly. Yeah, it really is. <laughs> okay, so you mainly do mainly into the, to venues, so that would have that would have taken a bit of a plunge. Yeah, it did. No, we got hit pretty badly. Those first couple of months when we went into lockdown was, um, <laughs> yeah, literally we just signed a new uh, distributor in Melbourne, and they were like, "Can we just send the pallet back? We just don't want to hold it just in case." Like, right. Yeah. Okay. Right. So you've got to hold it. Yeah. Um, however, you know. Not to be sort of too, you know, depressing about it, but um, we've you know, we had a bit of a kind of pickup in direct sales. We've been supported by a couple of really good um, uh, bars and restaurants, particularly in Sydney, and, and one in in Melbourne that's done really well for us. They've continued buying it and sort of pushing it out to their sort of mailing lists as well. Yep. Um, we've been approached by Dan Murphy's uh, to to range three of the wines, which is which is pretty cool. Which mm. is looking like we'll probably do that. Um, so, yeah, so things are sort of turning around nice. um, and we just hope to try and get a couple of those export deals back on the table as well. Yeah, nice. 
So, I mean, on that as well, so we buy a lot of our wine uh, from cellar doors because I'm, I'm in sales, I love a story. I'm, I'm a sucker for a story, <laughs> right? So is, is it best to to do the Dan Murphy's thing or to, to go straight to cellar door and support the winery there? Like, Oh, look, if you – yeah, it really is probably the cellar door is the place to do it. Yep. Excuse me. Um, yeah, because you, you really are sort of putting – all the margin, mm. take, taking out the, the multiple middlemen. Yeah. Um, so it does. But, um, but you know, that sort of said, it's, you have kind of different sort of sides of it. If you're going to, like, you love the story, you love going out to the vineyards, which many of us do. Mm. Um, it's, you know, how a lot of people really fall in love with it, especially coming from overseas, being, you know, sort of expats. Yeah. Um, in Australia, it's one of the things we've really nailed ex- you know, exceptionally well. Mm. Um yeah, kind of put, putting the cash straight back into the pocket is a great way to do, to do it. But um, in order to sort of help brands grow, it's to sort of get out to that wider market, you know, and uh, kind of capture that, I suppose, um, more convenient sort mm. of purchase, you know. Oh, yeah, I'm going to barbecue. I need a X, Y, Z. Yeah. Pop into, pop into mm. one of the big re- retailers. Yeah, okay. Mm. Fair enough. And, and walk us through... Your wines. Why did you choose a Shiraz, Sa Blanc? You've got a Nebbiolo there. Why? Why those ones? Well, look, it all started with Nebbiolo, actually. Um, <laughs> that was probably, <laughs> yeah. Whoops. Why is um, that? Well, it's it's an interesting sort of variety. It takes it's a bugger to grow. Um, it's actually really difficult to find the fruit now. If I'm honest, mm. um, everyone's sort of been after it. It's become very popular, and um, it's uh, to sort of do it as I call properly, it needs a, a good couple of years in, mm. in bottles. So again, adding to that, you know, that woeful cash flow, you have to, you have <laughs> yeah. to, you have to hold on to it for a while before it really sort of hits its stride. Um, and I mean, they're fine young, but it, they really become great with sort of two years in, in bottle. Um, and, uh, and I sort of make it particularly in that, that sort of way. So, um, yeah, it started with two tons of, of Neb from, um, the Willoughby Bridge Vineyard in, in Heathcote in Victoria. And uh, it was one that um, Luke Lambert was using for many years and I had a chat to him and uh, he said, look, I'm not taking the fruit anymore. Go, go speak to the guys. So um, that's how that kind of kicked off. And then, uh, yeah, the following year it was like, right, I'll take some savvy and have a crack at, you know, something a bit more avant-garde, I guess. Yeah. And uh, it just grew. And the trouble is once you get under your skin, you're like, oh, yeah, I need to find some Riesling and Moscato to make a blend and I have to do this and... Yeah, before you know it, you're, yep. su- you're suddenly racking up all the uh, all the skews. Yeah. So, why does a wine need agent or time in a bottle? What uh, happens in there? Well, look, as soon as you, you stick it in bottle, you get the, the classic bottle shock, as mm-hmm. it's sort of known, and um, it can. You can so have what a, is bottle shock? It's when you wake up in the morning uh, <laughs> after a massive night, and you're taking the empties down to the recycle bin. That's, yeah. uh, that's bottle shock. Yeah. I drank what? Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise known as Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, when you basically, you sort of take the wine from, you know, effectively you, you put it from barrel or wherever in, in, into tank and then, uh, stick it through the bottling line. Mm-hmm. And so you can have a wine, you look at it going, oh, that's fantastic. I'm really pleased with this one. This happened a few times. I'm getting quite used to it now. And, um, it kind of goes through the lime. You get the bottle off the other end, which is always exciting. Very mm-hmm. sort of, you know, good uh, bit of satisfaction. And, uh, and you can't, you try and, you try and wait a couple of days at least and you kind of crack it open and you're like, oh yes, that's okay. That's mm. not quite how I remember it. Often a little bit sort of disjointed, I kind of say a bit spiky, things aren't kind of quite in sort of in balance. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, that's basically bottle shock. Mm. It's kind of knocking the wine around. Um, and it can take anything from sort of two months to six months for it to really kind of get back to where it should be. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. And then the age in the wine? Like why does, it, why does wine get better over time or a certain amount of time? Yeah, well, that's, that's kind of sort of true and not true. It's kind of a funny one that you go back 20 years or, or further mm-hmm. or much further and, you know, wine was pretty rough. Yeah. Especially some of the Italian stuff. Oops, probably shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but we are not going to move for? Yeah. <laughs> you know you stopped recording that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cut. Delete. <laughs> Um, but no, a lot of it was, and that was, that was just because, um, the, the winemaking wasn't as clean, the, you know, the wineries weren't as clean, the, the technology wasn't quite there, uh, and the knowledge, right? And, um, those wines that were a bit rough around the edges, you know, bits of overly tannic, overly mm. extracted, you put them in a bottle for, you know, a couple of years or more, and they just start softening out. And mm-hmm. there is actually a whole chemical process that involves, 
um, everything from mm. sort of the tannin and the acids are the two sort of real key ones, and, and even the color pigments make a make a difference. Mm. And effectively, it sort of it it falls out a solution, which is why you get the crystals in, in older yeah. wines. Um, and that will be made up of tannin color. If you ever crush those, they're bright, bright kind of colored. Mm. Obviously, talking talking reds, um, and that is actually the color pigment falling out of solution. Yeah. And that just sort of softens the wine. So in today's age, most of the booze is is really made for for immediate drinking, or a lot mm -hmm. of it is. Um, but that's not to say that it doesn't it doesn't get better uh, in, in bottles. So do we make better wine now compared to what we used to? So why is everyone frothing yeah. over like Chateau Margaux sixty whatever it is? You know, <laughs> like everyone like there's those old really quintessential wines that everyone talks about and pays ridiculous money for. Is that wine really just really shit or is it good? Um, I've never had a sixty one Margaux, so I couldn't tell you. I'd love to. Um, mm. and, that, and I think that's the point, right? Yeah. It's that aspirational yeah. kind of thing. Oh, you know, mm. I've had it for. Yeah, how many years? You know, yeah. right? And um, and and they do they do improve, and those incredible you know sort of either vintages or classic uh, vineyards or, or estates and domains and things do have that sort of element of kind of quality that get better. But it is really kind of going back to you know it's like you know, fine you know mm. nine five eights and things like this kind of mm. classic cars. They become a rarity, right? Yeah, and um, and people love you know love a rarity. I think yeah. retros even cooler now than it has been in years. Big but, time. Yeah, it really is. And mm. um, I think it's just the ability to sort of have something, hold on to it, collect mm. it, and they do appreciate and value. Mm. Um, so do you think we're making the best wine these days with all of the sort of controls and yeah, sanitization so, and everything? Yeah, like I say, we are actually. I think, it's, again, it's come full circle. We yeah. went probably sanitized is actually quite a good way to put it. I think for a while we were just getting so good at making incredibly consistent mm. good wine that that's all we did and it's all lost a bit of the magic yeah um whereas now you know over, again, over the last 10 years right you've had the whole natural wine movement sort of moving forward with mm. people putting a bit more personality and a bit you know yeah going back full circle uh and that's giving real character back to the wines yeah. and i think those are now kind of converging um i guess that's kind of where i put some of mine i, I consider them well, pretty well made wines mm. But they've all got a bit of personality and a bit of character there you know i don't filter certain things they're all wild you know which most people are now doing not just the the wine the, the sort of the natural wine guys mm -hmm. so yeah kind of sit somewhere in the middle what what does that mean i mean you've, you've said a few things that i've written down you've, you've said spiky bottle shot you've said the <laughs> wines are wild personality i mean wine there's a kind of i think there's a bit of misconception with wine where everyone thinks you've got to be a bit of a you know wine okay. wanker. that'll do <laughs> uh to but actually we, we just drink what we like yeah and and so the vocab around it, where does that come from? Or do you just make it up as you go along? Um, sometimes. <laughs> no. Knew it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously for me. Uh, no, that's not, that's not entirely true. Look, there, there is yeah. tennis there is, balls and yeah, apple. And that's right. <laughs> slapped mint. I'm sure I've told you that. I've the story before. <laughs> Yeah, I probably shouldn't go tell. But yeah, no, it's, um, there is actually a sort of science behind it. And I guess that's the thing is that going through training and having that education, you build a, um, a sort of a character mm. um, sort of profile and, and characteristics of wine. Mm. Um, and they do need to sort of mean something. And often they, they might only mean things to yourself, but there is, I guess, a, a convergence of, mm. of meanings for, for people out there. Um, and doing sort of study like, you know, the Wessex course or the Master Sommeliers gives you that sort of systematic tasting mm -hmm. which allows you to then share it with other people that might know it and they'll sort of go yeah okay i know, know where you're coming from is that master simulator is that the one where i think there's a few on netflix called the som yes is that where they train for that yeah i mean that's just insane yeah the, the stuff they're doing like they literally they blind taste they they name the year the the grape varietal they, the winemaker everything yeah. it's very impressive and you can just tell you can almost see them going through the back of their head like picking out these little cards Roll and, and decks, just yeah. putting it together yeah, that's it it's very impressive you need to have a pretty damn good palette but you also need to almost arguably more than that you need to have tried a lot of wines and you need to have looked at wines and, and done that sort of systematic process mm. you can't just go well actually there are a few people <laughs> one guy knows particularly good he sticks his nose in something and goes, yeah, it's a, you know, it's yeah. Isn't there one guy that forty-eight mile ago? There was only one guy that won that without even trying a wine. Like he tried, like he smelt five wines and oh, really? then said what they all were, and then like passed his master's time. He didn't even drink one. That's pretty impressive. And he's the only one that's ever done it. Yeah, 
This could be total bullshit, but yeah, I thought I heard that somewhere. <laughs> that would be pretty impressive. Yeah. We'll, we'll fact check that. Yeah. yeah. So there's citation needed. So, citation. Yeah. So there is some method in the vocab, then. There is. Yeah. Right. No, there, there definitely is. There really is. And um, certain characteristics in terms of sort of those flavour descriptors are the ones that kind of get grouped together. Now they can be a little bit, you know, out there at times, but you know, if you've sort of had that little sort of base training, it does kind of pull that together and sort of get. Um, I guess categorized in, in similar uh, other ones. Yeah, okay. I've noticed. <coughs> sorry, excuse me. I've noticed in restaurants a lot lately that orange wine seems to be getting quite popular. What's yep. the go with that? Is that just longer skin fermentation? Why is it? Why is a wine wine orange like? Well, actually, what you're drinking now is technically an, or- an orange, orange wine. An orange yeah. wine. Um, but as you can see, it's not orange, um, and that's because it hasn't been oxidized. So it's subjective. Uh, no, um, yeah. Um, it is skin contact almost yeah. invariably, but it's also that ability to have a little bit of um, oxidation within the winemaking process. And that's what kind of gives it that that sort of um, ambery orange mm. colour. So that's where the, sort of the name um, amber comes from. Seems to be from. quite trendy now. Super trendy. Yeah. It's everywhere. Um, I, yeah, I, I started doing it back in 2013 mm-hmm. and... Clearly, I was a, a trailblazer. Obviously. Pioneer. Obviously. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah no, I wish. Um, no, I do it in Georgia about a million years ago. Um, but I put, in my slight naivety, I put orange Sauvignon Blanc on the label. And um, considering I made maybe, I don't know, a hundred dozen of this, not very much. And, uh, and somebody got hold of it. And Wine Australia basically sent me a letter saying... Um, a really threatening letter, basically saying that uh, they were going to prosecute me, and you know there was prison and up to five hundred grand's worth of fines because I'd misused the uh, the word orange. Because of course there is a region, yeah, region, yeah, called, called orange. Um, yeah, so uh, that was fun. So I hired a very expensive lawyer well. to tell them to f off. That was fun. But if you look up now, uh, Orange Gate on Twitter, mm. that was it. That was yeah, eight years ago. Wow. <laughs> yeah stressful Fair so that didn't so, help the cash flow either that year in, you know in, yeah, in sitting out but look to be honest it's, it's a fair enough but um they had no idea what an orange wine was mm. and that was the really none yeah so a lot of the and look fair enough I, it was incorrect on my, my, on my part but you know the way they handled it wasn't very smart yeah, yeah. but it showed how those type of wines just weren't considered in the normal wine vocabulary mm. you know, you know, coming full circle to that kind of conversation you know and these are the guys that really should know about it um, and they didn't. So, um, and to be fair, they you know they did sort of change change some of the, some of the rules around that mm. moving forward. But um, yeah, yeah, it's come come a long way. So, staying on jargon, I've got a few a few terms that I want to ask you. Right, I'm going to play <laughs> yeah. a little game here. So, on lees, what does that mean? On lees, so once you fermented a wine, mm. the dead yeast cells um, basically drop to the bottom. Mm-hmm. It becomes like a milky sort of consistency, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, that is the lees. Yeah. So you can leave it on lees, you can use lees to do various sort of things. Um, Chardonnay is a classic example of, you know, you leave it on lees in, mm-hmm. in barrel and you might stir it, and that kind of gives it a bit of sort of more mid-weight kind of um, texture mm-hmm. in, in the palate is a good way to sort of put it. Um, but they're quite cool. You can use, you know, use lees and pump them through <clears throat> wines that might have a bit of reduction, which is where it hasn't seen enough air in the winemaking process and it gets a little bit sort of pongy, mm-hmm. um, which is fine. It kind of normally kind of blows off, but you can actually use the lees in that to, to do things. Uh, or classic muscadet is another one. So you might see muscadet sur lee, and uh, that means it's you know, it's left on, on lees for, I think it has to be a year before being bottled. All right. Uh, Metho traditional. Sparkling. Yeah. That's our friends in Champagne. Mm-hmm. Uh, that means bottle fermentation, effectively. Yep. So second, second ferment in, in bottle. Thank you. Uh, terroir? That's a good one. Um, <laughs> French, obviously. Uh, it effectively is what they sort of use to describe, I guess, the environment from which the wine was produced. And that can be soils, it can be climate, microclimate, um, even arguably down to winemaker uh, sort of intervention and decisions. But um, sort of if you kind of say a true terroir kind of wine or wine that shows terroir, it really is sort of showing very much its distinct place yep. of where it came from. All right. Uh, and then what is a clean skin? An unbottled, uh, unlabeled 
bottle of wine. Why is it clean? Oh, just because it's got nothing on it. You're right. Literally got nothing on it. <laughs> yeah. And that could be anything, right? You might, because, you know, it's fine when you're making small batches like this, but sometimes, you know, I might not have got the labels ready, so I'll just bottle it because I want to, you know, I've got the, the bottling mm. line in and you want to kind of get it in, in bottle and then you, you label it at a later date. You might be making literally tens of thousands of bottles mm. and some are for an export market, so you just don't, you don't label them. And uh, when they're ready to go to export, you then stick the labels on. Um, and that's where, the, I guess, that having that, again, going to sort of the, the cellar doors and stuff, people will be like, oh, yeah, I've got some clean skins. Well, they might be an export order that didn't quite take as much or whatever it mm. is. Um, quite often, nothing wrong with the wine. So it's not a lesser wine? Um, well, it's seen that it is, but mm. it most a lot of the time it, it may not be. Okay. Um, it's just, you know, wine making is logistics at the end of the day, especially okay. bottling. So having yeah, the ability to kind of do, you know, dynamic things is actually really important. So you spoke about climate. Now this mm. year, you know, we the, the summer was very much masked and with the with the bushfires. Um, did did that affect your your turf, as it were, your batches where you where you grow your fruit in the hood um, with those fine growers that do an amazing job? Yeah, it did partly, but to be honest, most of my, most of my vineyards weren't smoke taint affected. We ran the tests and you know chemical tests and and they, they were fine, so that was good. Um, but it was an utterly shocking year anyway, even before we got to, uh, to the bushfires. Mm. Uh, that's central Victoria or parts of central Victoria. And that was really because we had a couple of really hot days during flowering, which would be in October, sort of 40 degree, degree days. And um, sort of the effective flowers kind of fell off. So, that, so the fruit set became incredibly sporadic and very low. So the yields are low. Um, the quality of the fruit, to be honest, is, is pretty average. Um, not a good year for us. So when you say yields, you mean the actual physical grapes that you pick yeah, so, and can crush? So bunches were really small. Um, right. And then there were fewer bunches on many of the vines. Right. Um, even to the point where it sort of made hand harvesting uh, too expensive. Because instead of kind of doing a 300 meter row, you'd yeah. have to kind of do twice that to get the same amount of fruit. And of yeah. course, you know, it costs, costs cash. So... Yeah, it wasn't great. Um, I know a few people have had some okay stuff coming out and um, I'm sure WA will be perfect because it always is. They seem to be uh, blessed, um, which is good. But um, yeah, look, a lot of the stuff I've seen doesn't look too crash hot this year. Yeah. So would that mean, one thing I've always wondered, do you know what, so what have we got here? We've got the, what's it, Sad Blanc? It's a 2018 Sad Blanc. So yep. is that, is the 18... The year that the fruit is picked, or is that when it goes into bottle? What does the the year on the bottle mean? Picked, always picked, yeah. always picked. Yep, yeah. So that was that we picked. You heard team. it here first, team. <laughs> Did yeah. you know that? Yeah. Oh right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was actually a question we got uh, asked yeah, before that's the right. show. Uh, Some, someone uh, phoned in. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, yeah, always always the vintage. But you know, you also get things like yeah, non vintage, obviously mm. classic NV, mm. which is a, is the blend of other bits and pieces. So. Always so being a winemaker, what makes a – like what's a perfect wine for you? So say – like what do you look for? What characteristics in the grape, in the fruit, in the wine process, in the bottle process, everything? What's What makes it the perfect wine when it comes out? Oof. It's easier to talk about other people's wine than myself, my own, I think, is probably the way. It's, it's I guess I like I do really like wines with sort of character. I kind mm-hmm. of bang on a bit about that. Yeah. Um, so do I. I get really bored of – Generic stuff. Mm-hmm. They might be incredibly well-made wines, but yeah, yeah, that's okay. That's okay. So, so, give us some examples. What do you drink? If, you, <laughs> if you're not if you're not drinking your stuff, what else are you drinking? Um, I am drinking at the moment a lot of <laughs> bits of pieces. <laughs> everything. That's it. A lot. <laughs> I'm, I'm drinking, drinking a lot. lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Beer. Actually, got a shit ton of beer. Um, no, I um, I, 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 I sort of went through a stage of actually not drinking too much wine that sounds kind of crazy but um no. compared to when i was kind of training and things where you're, you're constantly tasting 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 mm. um i went through a bit of a sort of stage where i was sort of i was still doing quite a lot of tasting compared to most people but not, not crazy and i've sort of kind of pulled back and i've kind of got back into it again lately which has been quite exciting it's one good thing about covid i suppose I had a bit more time mm. um so i've been looking at a lot of uh sort of friends of mine that import wines i've been looking at a lot of kind of cool stuff that they're they're doing um, working with the Loire has been quite good. So I've been looking at a lot of those at the moment, putting together big sort of lists for masterclasses that we're going to run with the trade. Um, so lots of Cab Franc. Mm-hmm. I love Cab, Cab Franc, pretty on trend as a sort of medium yeah. bodied red. It's got, you know, it often has a bit of funk going on on it. Um, and uh, I find that, that quite quite good, quite interesting. Um, 
I've kind of dipped my toe a bit more into the water or back into the water for, for Jura and Arbois, which is a really sort of similarly kind of wine wankery thing to go, oh, yeah, I love Jura. Jura's the best, you know. Mm. Um, and actually, they are really, really cool wines. And that's because they um, are very slightly oxidized or can be wildly so, but um, they live under a, a layer of floor, which is effectively sort of very similar to how they do it in um, in Sherry, in, in Jerez, for, for, for classic Spanish sherry, mm. which gives this amazing sort of salinity and um, and just quite sort of a, a distinctive sort of note, but in a in a dry white, not fortified, um, and uh, that's been pretty cool. Uh, I've enjoyed kind of getting back into a few of those, mm. especially with roast chicken. Oh man, lovely cracker! cracker. Yeah, really yeah. good. So yeah, a few a few bits and pieces like that. So I've been drinking at the moment. Um, what else have we got coming up? Yeah, no, those those are the big ones at the moment. So what's your f- who is your favourite winemaker? Sorry. Other than yourself, like if you had to choose a, your favourite winemaker anywhere in the world. I definitely wouldn't choose myself. Um, <laughs> there's much better people than me. I don't know, that's a really good question actually. Um, there's a couple of real classic Italian Nebbiolo producers that I think are pretty cool, um, all for sort of different reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, Giuseppe Mascarella, I think it is, which is a poorly pronounced. Mm-hmm. Sorry, that wasn't you're, that bad, actually. You're, 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 it's pretty good. It's way better than John. <laughs> <laughs> Your Italian would be a hell of a lot better than mine. I'm still trying to write it down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, don't spell it. That's a, that's a, that's a no-no. Um, actually, that's another thing about doing those exams. You have to be able to spell, you know, consortio. To, uh, yeah, Giacomo Conterno. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And you're like, geez, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, Yes, yeah, so a lot of those Italian guys, I must admit, having kind of bagged Italian wine earlier, I don't feel that way too. I, I love Italian wine. It's one of my favourites. And um, particularly around that sort of Piemonte uh, yeah. kind of area, there is some really cool stuff coming out of there. Um, Moving on to that, what's your favourite region? If you had the- that is probably my favourite region. Yeah. It's also just stunning if you've mm. ever had a chance to kind of go there. Mm. Beautiful. Sat at the top of Lamora, one of the kind of the communes high up, looking down through the valley of, uh, of Barolo. Yeah. And there's a few things better than that. It's pretty cool. I Plus agree. the food is just stupidly yeah. good. You go, okay. you go for a glass of wine and you kind of you end up eating kind of half a kilo of uh, incredible charcuterie that you know sort of mama's made out the back yeah. and uh, yeah, amazing, emotional, <laughs> <laughs> spiritual. It's going to take, yeah. take a time out while uh, <laughs> yeah. Adriana dries his eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So God, um, when, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> so when we look at the wines, actually, it's, it's interesting coming over here because you mentioned WA. <clears throat> what I found is that. Certain parts of Australia do, yeah. In in France, you know, you, as you said, you've got Provence, which is t- traditionally rosé, Loire, which is traditionally the Chenin, Chenin kind of blancs and Chenin and Cabernet, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and Sauvignon, of course, with yeah. uh, Sancerre. Yeah, and and then over here, so you've you know you can get a cracking cab sav in Margaret River, which is you know mm. WA, but then you can get a really good cab sav in Adelaide Hills, and you know you can each each kind of state has got its own little climate of. Of the wineries, if, if you know the different varietals, yeah, you can pretty much do anything anywhere to some degree, mm. but of course, they're all slightly different, which is mm. the and that's the beauty of wine, right? It's um, going back to that terroir, it you know, is a reflection of where it was grown and who made it and in what year, yeah. Um, but yeah, you can, and that's also we don't have any rules that it has to be, and of course, that's the classic, I guess, sometimes looked down upon from the new world, which is you know, we see people like ourselves in Australia, the US, and you know, maybe South Africa is we don't have that um, appellation system, which is incredibly highly um, uh, regulated, you know, to the point where, you know, if you're going to make a sonser, it has to have, have a certain yield, which, you know, otherwise you can't call it sonser. It just goes into the lower levels. And that's kind of good because it does kind of keep a real um, quality level across those wines. But arguably in today's market, um, especially with kind of things like the rise of, you know, a lot of the sort of more, more naturally focused guys, <clears throat> excuse me, um, they don't really care mm. because they, they know their wines are good. They know they've looked after their, mm. um, the, the vineyards and everything else and it's, you know, highly diverse. Um, so they, they don't really kind of need need those um, those rules any longer. And so that's quite an interesting, I guess, uh, issue that's kind of rising out, out, out of that. So does that mean people – let's just call it from you know, mainland Europe, you know, do, do they then look down on Aussie wine because of that lack of regulation? Um, I think traditionally they certainly have, whether they do anymore. Mm. 
I mean, the French love to look down at everybody, especially when it comes to wine. <laughs> I mean, they do make some great wine, but of course it's the heritage. And I think they're still upset with the South Africans for having, you know, <laughs> Pinotage, aren't they? Their own, their own brand and their own, their own varietal. Yeah, well, I was at the um, Chenin Blanc conference last, oh. last year in, in Loire. I was very lucky to be invited across. I'm the, you know, it's the only Australian there, actually. And um, I don't make Chenin Blanc, and I wish I, wish I did. It's a lovely variety. Yeah, yeah, go for it, man. Knock yourself out. I'll have a little, little drop. Um, and that was really cool because the South Africans make more Chenin Blanc than mm-hmm. even you know, the home of Chenin Blanc, which is the Loire. And uh, it was quite cool. And you sort of have these incredibly technical um, talks from, from the French about how they're going to do something. But they don't actually talk about how they're going to do it. They talk about how they're going to think about doing it, possibly <laughs> in about 20 years' time. Yeah. And then the South Africans kind of turn up and go, right, it's like this, bang, 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 yeah. bang. And everyone's like, oh, right, yeah, maybe we should just do it their way. It was, it was pretty cool. But no, there, there, was, there was good good interaction. That was a really fun, that was a fun trip. Oh my God, my teeth hurt after all that acid. Ooh. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> so if you do a tasting, I mean, how many, how many glasses are you tasting? Oh, hundreds. Four. In, in a day? Yeah. So you but, can't be drinking them? No, no, no. They're not drinking. Did you, when you first started, did you, did you think, oh, I'm going to give this a go? I'll, I'll, I'll be the one that does drink them. And I'm, then, I'm pissed for it. I can do this. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe a couple of times. Um, yeah, but sometimes you get something really good and you're like, oh, that is really good. I'm not spitting that out. Yeah. Mm. Or when we were over there, we, we were incredibly lucky to try a, um, a Cote de Leon. Um, and we did a whole vertical tasting from the current vintage. That's a, a sweet Chenin Blanc white wine. And uh, the current vintage is two, 2009. They released it with 10 years of age. And we did 2009 back to 1963. And oh. uh, awesome. And then they went, wow. do you want to try something really, really special? And they kind of bought out 1847 or 74. Either way, a very old bottle of wine, far older than anything I'd ever tried before. And it was, yeah, they bought out two of those. And there was about, uh, there was about 25 of us there for, the, for this Chenin Blanc conference. We sort of tried it and, you know, there were tears, you know, people were like, holy crap, this is amazing. Imagine what's happened since this got put into bottle. Yeah. Uh, fascinating stuff and still tasted great. That's so much for me to process. Like how <laughs> how did it taste? Like how does a bottle of a glass of wine that old taste like? What, and you're only getting a sip, you know. It's yeah. literally a couple of sips of each of, each of the bottles. We tried both of them because obviously they're both slightly different. And um, it was incredibly delicate, incredibly delicate, but it hadn't, fallen over you know but you try older you know white wines and reds and they sort of get to a stage where they become incredibly sort of hollow I guess, yeah. and there's nothing really left and this didn't have any fruit either but it it sort of it had that kind of nice honeyed and there was still that kind of dried apricot thing going on and yeah it was pretty cool how do you keep a wine for that long without going off like what well, sort of they actually recorked it in the 50s in the 50s can you believe okay. that yeah uh, and they said, because we were like, you know, how many bottles of this you got left? And they're like, well, you know, we've probably got another I don't know, 600 bottles or so. I'm like, wow, that's pretty cool. But they had over a million bottles in storage, wow. all, all dug into these kind of caves that they, they dug. Yeah. And they, hide, they hid them all from the, um, in both world wars, because obviously yeah. it's that old. They yeah. hid them from the Germans twice by building walls across it. So they thought it, you know, there's nothing there. Yeah. Wow. Incredible stories. That's, Crazy. that's actually one of the cool things when I, before I moved over here, we did. Um, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, so I apologise for everybody that's that's listening and watching. <laughs> Went to Reims, Reims. That'll do. Yep. Uh, the Champagne District of France, and we we went to some of the Champagne houses. Went to Pommery actually. Oh yeah, that's and they a... took us downstairs to all the car, the, not the carves. That's the Italian way of doing it. But basically, all the all the caves where they keep it all. Yep. And they were talking us through some of the old, you know, royalties that had their. It was like that so and so selection, that so and so's collection, yeah. and all that kind of stuff. It was incredible, and you'd get them. They'd, they'd show us the, the kind of wine racks where you'd have to. Someone was employed to just go and t- turn Twist the bottle it. just slightly every kind of week or so yeah. to make sure, and that was part of the fermentation process and moving all the yeast around and it's stuff. Called uh, riddling is the is it? Okay. Yeah, that's what they, they call it. Yeah, as you, exactly right. And they sort of turn it, and then they tilt it as well. It's yeah. not just spinning it; it's spinning it, and so eventually you kind of go. Having it kind of like this, you slowly go up over time, so it's upside down. Yeah, and all that dead yeast cells, the lees from the second fermentation, stuck in the bottom. Yeah, the bit that I still don't get, and I've seen it a couple of times, is how they get that out. It's called disgorging. They yeah. kind of plunge it into kind of freezing cold water or or an ice bath. It freezes the plug, and of course, because it's under pressure, they then take off the cap and it fires it out, and then they recap it. Do you know how difficult that would be to do yeah. by hand? What? Yeah. Crazy. Yes. So cork or cap? 
on that note. <laughs> cool, cool. Oh, that's another conversation. <laughs> um, well, as you can see, I'm, I'm using um, cap mm. across mine. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm in two. Uh, yeah, tough one. I actually really like cork, and I find that having stuff in uh, screw cap, even though mine are under screw cap, it's great, keeps them in perfect condition, um, but it slows down the aging process. Mm. It slows it down. Which is good and bad, you know. So for you know those kind of more immediate type style drinkers, that's that's cool. Um, but for things like the Nebbiolo, I kind of want it to evolve perhaps a little bit quicker than it has. Yeah. Um, and, and it does, yeah, the, the, the Stelvin screw caps do, do slow down that evolution of wine. Do you find that um, there's still that um, it's a screw cap, so it, it's not a premium wine? Is there still that kind of thinking around if it's got a cork, then it must be a premium wine? Yeah, well, there, there's a bit of that um, in the US and China, definitely. They're real From a consumer base? From a consumer point, yeah. Right. Yeah, they don't like screw cap at all. They like screws? No. Um, they don't like a good screw. Terrible. Um, that's probably where they're going wrong. And um, good, over, over good pinot here, in the USA, in Portland, in Oregon, they do good pinot. They do great pinot. Yeah, no, very, very good pinot. Um, there's great ones actually coming out of the US at the moment. I really like them. We just hardly ever see them because they're so mm. bloody expensive. Yeah, like ridiculously expensive. Um, not that I'm a huge fan of the cabs. Actually, I say that I've had a couple of really good. <laughs> have, you, have you tried Ridge Ridge Estate? Oh, they do uh, one called Montebello, and it's a uh, it's actually a blend. I think it's more of a Bordeaux blend. Mm. It is bloody awesome. Really good. Highly, yeah. rec- highly recommended. We'll get on that. Yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, go on. No, go on. You crack on. I can't remember what I was going to say now. I was going to say something. Oh, that's what I was going to say. And this is just purely my own point of view, so it could be complete, you know, yes. But um, I think, again, with the sort of the, the more natural winemaking kind of guys coming through and almost invariably all moving to um, or back to, to cork, Going back to your question, I think that's kind of had a bit of an effect on people's kind of perception is, oh, yeah, okay, well, you know, technically these are all natural wines. They've got less than 30 parts free sulfur in them, so they could be entered in any natural wine um, competition in the world, pretty much. Um, but obviously I use I use uh, screw cap, and um, I think that's that's a, an interesting sort of point is that a lot of those guys, is it is it natural wine if it doesn't have... Um, a natural cork in it. So talk talk me through what is a natural wine. What, what what's do I have the, to? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, yeah, do, no, well, what, what, what makes the, it natural? What what, do, what are we doing differently? Well, look, that, that, that is actually a, uh, it's a huge kind of question. That's why I sort of like oh, it's because we've what, got another three hours. We've got plenty yeah, of time, yeah, and, and we've got plenty of booze. Yeah, so that's all right. Like, yeah, you double pumped. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I think that's that's the kind of the question, right? What is natural wine? Because these are natural wines, as are a lot of conventional wines. You could argue they're natural wines too. What mm. what, make, what makes them natural? And I suppose it's it's kind of going back to more of they're more of a terroir type wine where they are you know, not interfered with in sort of more mechanical processes. The the fruit is raised and grown in a you know a sustainable way, whether that's organic or biodynamic. Uh, we can go into that if you need to, but um, there, there's there's all that sort of side of it as well. So I think kind of that natural wine is is that sort of not interfering too greatly with the process right. of, of turning that that fruit into into wine. Um, it's probably it's the, the real sort of crux. You ask cork or cap. I'm going to ask about the bottles. Is what's why why different shape bottles? I mean, is it like perfume where it's part of the marketing, or is there is there a rhyme and a reason behind? A slightly fatter bottle for Bordeaux, and you know the yeah. the Riesling bottle is obviously typically taller and and very lean and very thin. Yeah. Why is that? The, the classic Alsace flute. That's the mm, yeah. those Riesling uh, the cracking sort of... magnum of Alsace at uh, Little Felix the other night. Not to myself, those with other people. <laughs> Lies, but really, really good, really good spot. Yeah, Sick invite. Was... Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> You're going out for dinner. Like, oh, in, in COVID times, you're lucky. Actually, I need to do more of that. I, <laughs> we were talking the other night, exactly the same. <laughs> need to make the most of it. Uh, supporting the industry is what, we, is what we technically call mm, it on our, on, our, on our Baz returns. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so traditionally Alsace flutes, yeah, longer, sort of skinnier ones. Um, I would be making it up if I said there was a particular reason for that um, particular sort of shape. I'm sure there is. Um, I know Bordeaux's, are obviously the ones with sort of mm. more straight, with the higher shoulders, perhaps more kind of classic shape. That 
partly because the shoulder catches more um, sediment and Bordeaux wines are traditionally kept for quite a long time. Um, so they, they tend to throw a sediment during that aging process. So that kind of shoulder as you're pouring kind of helps kind of do that. Okay. Um, Nebbiola has its um, own shape. Uh, and I can't remember the name of it. It's something like a, a bit like the Arbath, you know, something, something <laughs> yeah. similar to that. The Abrath, I think it is, something that's similar. Um, and again, that's sort of a bit of a half and half sort of shape. Um, compared to sort of, this is a burgundy bottle. Um, but a lot of it's marketing, a lot of it's personal preference. Um, I've always loved burgundy bottles, always. So I purposely chose them for that, that sort of reason. And I've stuck more on the same one because it's, it's much easier from a logistic point of view. Yeah. Um, otherwise you have to buy different boxes and everything else. So, yeah. Okay. And born and raised, where did that come from? Yeah, I was going to ask that. Mm. Yeah, that well, was you just... you can tick that off, can't you? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> that one's done. <laughs> <laughs> have an answer there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah um, where did that come from? That, that, yeah, like anything, when you're starting a little small business, you have to spend hours on what you're going to call your, call your business, your, your enterprise. And um, yeah, I was trying to think about it. I, I didn't, I didn't want to make it about me. Um, I'm, not that eager, I'm, not, I'm not always that egotistical. So I kind of wanted to just make it more about a brand uh, and sort of something that it stood for. So yeah, Born and Raised kind of came about very much from that, that perspective of, I guess, Born of the Earth and sort of raised by hand or raised by sort of the individual. Um, and that sort of, I guess, you know, nature uh, nurtured is, I guess, where it kind of comes back down mm-hmm. to. Yeah. So what brought you over to Australia? Weather. Yeah. Yeah, I hated the UK. Everyone says that from the UK. It's yeah. always the weather. Did you move to a beach first as well? Of course, I moved yeah. to Bondi. <laughs> I had to. I didn't want to. I even said I'm not going to live in Bondi. I lived there for five years. I'm like, oh shit, got to suck it, suck it in, you know, because your mates are there. So um, yeah, no, I came over in what, 13 years ago. Now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so no, I'd, I'd come over beforehand and did the traveller thing, all that kind of stuff, and um, and loved it. I worked in Sydney um, for the best part of a year, and and really enjoyed it. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, so I kind of took, went back, took a few years doing some professional bits and pieces in mm-hmm. in, in London, and uh, yeah, managed to get back out. Yeah, nice. So you've only lived in Sydney, or I only lived in Sydney. Yeah, I considered moving down to to Melbourne, obviously. It's one of those sort of things you sort of feel a little bit of a, a fake sometimes because, you know, you're not living on the vineyards and, and all of that yeah. down in, in Victoria, um, which is, you know, partly bullshit. But, um, so how long would you spend at a vineyard when you have to go make the wine? The vineyards, it really depends. Quite often you're only really there, uh, you know, six or seven times during during the growing mm-hmm. season for, for a lot of them. Yep. Um, other ones where I actually make the wine on site, it's obviously that you're there more, so you get to see it a bit more. Um, so from that sort of side, yeah, look, that's why we, you know, I work very heavily with the growers. Hmm. They look after the fruit. They do things that you know I would be rubbish at. And yeah, under- and you know, understand completely, understand the theory, but you know, I've got soft hands. Yeah, these guys are gnarly old dudes, and yeah. they really know what they're doing. It's uh, yeah, it's a bloody hard job. They really are at the you know the mercy of, of, of Mother Nature. Um, so about vines, does it make a difference on the age of the vine, so the fruit? So you, you hear some people or some winemakers say, you know, this is like 60-year-old vines or something like that. There becomes a point where the vine doesn't produce any more fruit anymore as well. Talk that, us through that. Yeah, that sort of happens as well. Um, yeah, very much so. The, the older the vines, the, effectively the roots go deeper. Um, they sort of hit kind of optimal sort of yields and it all depends on of course how you how you prune them during their sort of the, the, the lifetime. Indeed what kind of soil they are and, and each sort of different variety has different kind of characteristics of how it sort of grows. Um but yeah the older the vine traditionally the the, the better the fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, and and really in a nutshell as it gets older it produces less um from a structure that you know has a lot of um I guess capacity is probably the best way to put it. And so you're kind of literally pumping in all the goodness rather than 10 bunches of a vine to, to two. So much better concentration. Um, and uh, I guess that's the real kind of key is it's, it's generally much more concentrated, mm. which makes better wine. Yeah. You know, they, the classic is, yeah, the best wines are, are, are grown in the vineyard and, and that is entirely mm. true. Yeah. When I say like American oak, French oak for barrels and stuff like that, does it make a difference to the flavour or the profile of the wine? Yeah. 
Yeah, and there's different like medium toast and all different types of barrels and all kinds of things. Yeah, yeah different forests. You can choose different forests. You can oh, choose wow. yeah different cuts, mm-hmm. different thicknesses, um, and each different barrel maker um, or cooper has cooper, their, has yeah. their own, I guess, character. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's probably the good terroir of the cooper. Totally. <laughs> oh, you can get really really into it. It's <laughs> wow. crazy. You think choosing a bottle is difficult. It's nothing compared <laughs> to choosing a, you know, a, a good quality French barrel. Yeah. And expensive too. Christ, yeah. it's so expensive, you know. And they've got a shelf life, don't they? Yeah, they kind of do. I mean, it depends if you're looking for that new oak sort of, you know, feeling, as it were, flavour. So it's really strong at the beginning? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And it is literally just quite sort of linear in how it sort mm-hmm. of becomes less um, overt in its um, oakiness. Mm-hmm. And, um, but they last years if, yeah. if they're well kept. And again, t- in today's sort of winemaking, a lot of people don't want you know, that, that new oak, kind of rich creaminess type sort of feel, feel to it. So, you know, <laughs> partly because it's a lot cheaper, but also, you know, I wasn't looking for big oaked um, wines. So I, I used very, very little new oak. Mm-hmm. Um, that was that kind of Chardonnay vibe, wasn't it? You know, the, the, the big buttery. Partly, you- yep, yep, definitely. And the Chardonnay, I mean, it, it, the thing is, if you ever smell good quality Chardonnay, actually even crap, Quality Chardonnay fermenting in a in a decent oak barrel. Mm. Oh man, the smell is fantastic. Mm. Lovely, it is absolutely like magic. Mm. That's one of those things that really hooks you in. So um, yeah, there's it, it, partly that. But look, you know, we've you look at all of our big top quality red wines, all very well known. You know, they use heaps of of new oak. You know, mm. um, and very expensive, good quality new oak, and they do they do taste pretty damn amazing at times. So if the wood's so good, why do people use still vats? There's always a place for steel vats. It kind of really keeps that purity of, of fruit. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and barrels, you know, I use barrels and obviously all the reds, but they that's often for some more micro oxygenation. And so you slowly have, the, again, it's like kind of having a bottle. It, they slowly evolve with very, very minute amounts of, uh, of, of air contact that are coming through the oak barrel. So it kind of lets the wine sort of breathe. Um, it's good for the second fermentation, which is the malolactic fermentation for, mm-hmm. for reds as well, which is obviously why you kind of often see oak influence in, in Chardonnays. They're not the only wine, but they're sort of the, the wine that traditionally goes at least part through malolactic fermentation. And that's a change in, it's not a change of sugar to alcohol, it's a change of acid, so from hard malic acid to, uh, to softer lactic acid. Um, so, yeah, there's always there's a, there's, there's a real sort of place in that. And also... Bigger format barrels are super popular these days, again, because they sort of control the oxygenation less. And it's, it's getting sort of having less overt flavours influence the wine and sort of less intervention, but still little bits of, you know, mm. winemaking sort of process and, and style. Um, like I'd kill to get hold of some sort of you know, foundries, which are those big, you know, two, three thousand litre wooden Old wooden uh, barrels, they're fantastic. Have you ever been to, to Gaia? You know Gaia, the, yeah, the, the, the Barbaresco producer? One that you have to pay to to get into. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I did all right. I didn't have to pay. I got a personalised tour by by the lovely uh, Angela Gaia. Oh, man, it was just yeah. magic. If you, if you ever get, get, that's another classic place to go, right? So it's literally a big steel door in this tiny little hamlet on, on a sort of a ridge line uh, in Barbaresco. And there's a church up, up the road. Which you have to go. Of course, have, there is. Which you have to have lunch. Yeah, exactly. You have to have lunch outside. That's pretty much the only place to eat. But it's pretty cool. And then this kind of big thing kind of comes back, and there's a huge courtyard. And to kind of cut a very long story short, you kind of go underneath, and they've dug out a three, three or four level winery underneath this big um, uh, sort of gravel area. I call it, but yeah, circle. That description. Absolutely amazing. All mm-hmm. dug into the rock. And it is like a James Bond baddie layer in the <laughs> 60s. You just expect kind of the car park to open up and this, you know, yeah. mothership. <laughs> of Nebbiolo goodness to kind of blast off. Yeah, that is really, really cool. But all down there, that's what they have is the foundries, these massive yeah. um, big barrels they've had for literally decades and decades. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I've them. seen that in uh, multiple channels as well. There's a few. Oh, yeah. I've never been there. actually. Yeah, I hear, hear good things of that. Yeah, it's, it's great. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The Italians do do it pretty well, I must admit. So, mm. yeah, pretty pretty cool. They've got quite a lot of varietals as well, isn't there? Like 1,200 or something varietals just in Italy. Something silly. Yeah, yeah. something crazy. Yeah. Because I'm always finding new wine from Italy that I've never heard of. Like there's a winemaker, Bressan. 
Scopatino or something like that. Scopatino, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Very peppery. Yeah. Fantastic. Really spicy, super yeah. bright red. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. from um, Friuli. Oh, is that Friuli? Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've made um, – oh, I've forgotten what I've made now. That's embarrassing. What have I made? It will come back to me. Mm. But I've made a, a Sagrantino. Oh, Yeah. That was lucky. Uh, to this this year, actually, and I say made it. Um, I, I'll put my hands up. I have hardly <laughs> touched the wine because I haven't been able to get to the yeah. winery. Um, which it's become quite popular that varietal as well, Sagrantino. Yeah, well, it's an interesting one because I thought, oh yeah, it's, yeah, there's loads of it from Italy. Mm. There's not. There's about twelve producers in Umbria. I think it mm. is down that sort of way, and uh, very very little of it. And uh, we've actually got, I think, more plantings of it, or almost as many plantings in Mildura here with Chalmers. Really? Uh, yeah. Yeah, really interesting. So I've done a, a whole berry sort of uh, ferment on that this year, which would be cool. Yeah, so that's quite looking forward to that. Mm. So why are we seeing that actually? Why are we seeing you know you're doing Nebbiolo, the Sagrantino, you know, in Adelaide Hills they're doing a lot more Gruner. Mm. And why are we seeing more of the European? Yeah, you know, Australia's been very famous for you know Shiraz, you know those big reds from Barossa, Shardy and Shardy. Why are we now starting to and Semyon as well for the Hunter Valley? Why are we starting to now bring I guess the European grapes and the European vines over? Yeah, it's um, <clears throat> excuse me. Yeah, I think it's uh, a number of different reasons. I could perhaps be a little bit cynical and say it's because people are always looking for something new, and that is definitely true. Mm. You really notice it in the uh, in the on trades. So that's kind of bars and restaurants. You know, you constantly they just want something new, mm. um, which is kind of understandable. So it's partly kind of market driven, um, but with the more winemaker sort of hat on, it's also driven by picking the right varieties that actually work better for our, our soil, soil types or, or, or climate. Um, and there's sort of talk that a lot of the, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of planty where it, it probably shouldn't be really. It's probably mm. too hot, or too dry, or whatever it might be. And a lot of those Mediterranean varieties that you sort of now see in, in much kind of greater volume are actually much better suited. Um, Things like Tempranillo, you can mm. see a lot of that. We're making some quite good temp now, mm. um, although we chuck way too much tartaric acid at it. So um, there's a few things that we can still improve on. But, um, yeah, and no, I think that's that's it. And it's quite interesting. So I mentioned Chalmers as a producer. They're quite interesting. They, they literally bring over the the, the clones, the, the, the clonal material, the cuttings, and they have to raise them and go through heaps of uh, sort of red tape to kind of bring in these new varieties. And they've got, <laughs> you mentioned, mm. yeah, 1,200 varieties from Italy. They have a lot of weird stuff, which um, is actually really yeah. quite quite exciting. So, so let's unpack that, right? So, you, I can't just go to Italy on holiday with a pair of nail clippers, you know, <laughs> click a vine from a vineyard, bring it back in my suitcase, and plant it. No, that's illegal. Yeah, so that's my. I'm, you, I don't you, know. You I'm know, like, those, you know, those little <laughs> those little beagles that run around the uh, border security. <laughs> yeah, 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 border security. They've yeah, not got up on they, TV. They've not got me yet. Um, but, um, <laughs> So, how, so you have to apply to bring in. You said a clone. Yes. Yeah. So you're not actually bringing in the vine. What are you bringing in? Uh, it is. It is. It is the vine. Effectively, it will be a, a cutting. Normally, probably so so sort of long. Right. Yeah, of, of vinyl material. Yeah. That you then have to um, propagate effectively. Right. Yeah. And I think I, I'm. And I don't know the full ins and outs of it at all. But um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that they have to sort of do it in a very controlled environment to make sure that there's no pest or disease brought into into the country. Right. Um, so it's quite a, quite a process. And then you get the tick and then you can go. And then they would then – so then winemakers would go and – Yeah. Do, would you bid to then buy that buy that vine? You can buy that vine and there's a whole sort of royalty system that sort of works behind it and everything. Yeah, it's quite, quite an oh. interesting part. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Something okay. I haven't really doubled in to be perfectly honest. Um, but, yeah, okay. yeah if, you, if you plant a vineyard, you'll know all about it. Yeah. Yeah. But what's interesting, you mentioned <laughs> that sort of throwing things in a suitcase – Obviously, a lot of the vines over here came over with sort of James Busby and there's that sort of whole historical thing. Um, but there's also, um, there are people that went across in the 60s and 70s and climbed over famous, you know, Montrachet walls and everything else and took a little snip and it came back. And there is there is definitely sort of that. Um, there is in New Zealand a Chardonnay clone, I think it is, or is it Pinot? But, but yeah, it came from one of the famous vineyards in, in Burgundy, and someone just took a little snip, and uh, back it came in the uh, in the in there, and that's so, the, and that's the best quality <laughs> clonal uh, vine yeah, over there. You can't get better than that, eh? Yeah. So Syrah and Shiraz, 
I've got to ask, right? So they're both the same grape varietal. Is it the way they're made that's different or is it all bullshit? It's identical. Uh, as far as I'm aware, it's, it's identical. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right. So that's just wine wankers going, no, it's Syrah. It's not Shiraz. Yeah, look, you that know. a very good English accent. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't what I was going for, either. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, in France, in Rhone Valley, mm. where, you know, you, they, apparently they called it Syrah because they believe it was raised in, in, in Syria, but I'm still not entirely convinced that's a a true argument or not. But uh, yeah, Syrah in France and mm-hmm. Sh- Shiraz. Shiraz here. Shiraz here. Okay. So mm-hmm. it's got nothing to do with anything else other than geography? Pretty much. Okay, cool. Yeah. And a lot of those vines that we have here, the old Shiraz vines, came from yeah. the Rhone. Mm. Um, you know, and, and arguably they're, they're older because we didn't get knocked out by mm-hmm. philosopher in the end of the 18th century like they did. Oh, wow. Yeah. Cool. So on the growing, I was down <clears throat> before lockdown. Uh, I was down in Mornington Peninsula and they're pretty good pinots down there. Mm-hmm. And they were, I don't know if this was just the chat, but they were saying that the pinot is the hardest grape to grow. It's very delicate. It's susceptible to, you know, everything. everything. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Just it's genetic makeup. Right. Simple as that. Yeah, it's a little finicky, tricky. It's called the God's Grape. Yeah, they talk about that because it's, you know, it's also addictive. You know, mm. Once you start making Pinot, you hook in and, yeah. I can't afford to buy any fruit for Pinot. That's not entirely true, but I can't get good quality fruit. It's yeah. very difficult yeah. to, to get good stuff. Is that because it's harder to make or harder to control? Yeah, and also, the, to be honest, it's getting more, more market-driven. Uh, Everyone wants Pinot. Mm. It's grown Because there's no cheap Pinots. No. Usually Pinots, you know, 40 bucks up. Yeah. Yeah, and it's and it's it's really market driven. There's there's less of it. People want more medium bodied Pinots. It's mm. easy to drink. People really enjoy them. Um, and it's just basically you know when things become popular, the, mm. the, the price per ton goes up. Of course. Um, and then as you say, because it's a tricky one to grow, it's, it's hard to get hold of good quality fruit. And it really again, it really does sort of show that that sort of terroir where it's grown, how it was yep. kind of that was, that was raised. Are you seeing um, in in the industry, and I guess. You know, when you're out and about talking to people, the Aussie Pinot is now more more desirable than again. We talk about the Kiwi Sav Blanc. Yeah, you know, Kiwi Pinot is also up there too worldwide. Is is Aussie Pinot now making a name for itself? No, right? Not 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 internationally. Right, um, okay. Surprisingly so. But again, that's because there's not enough of it. Mm-hmm. It's a bit like Italy. You know, you go to Italy and you sort of go around these little places and you're trying all this wine. And you're like, oh my god, this is good. They don't export it. They don't need to. Yeah, <laughs> keep all the good stuff for themselves. Um, so I think literally kind of, they do that. Even with Parmigiano, like yeah. Parmigiano, there's different grades. You can get yeah. the good Parmigiano around, like Parma and the Reggio Emilia and stuff like that. Yep. It, and then every time it goes out it, from a zone, it literally get, uh, loses its quality. It's not as good. It's not as good. Even in Italy, yeah. yeah. By the time it comes to Australia, mate, it's dog shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, work, I work with a, uh, a cheese importer directly for all the wine tasting stuff we do, and uh, yeah, and I, I buy a kilo off him kind of every I don't know, sort of. Three-ish months, I suppose. Oh, what are you going to say? Three days? Yeah, well, I wish. I <laughs> Every love three months. Well, yeah, that's still that's still pretty good for a kilo. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, good, it's a lot of cheese. <laughs> I cook a lot of pasta. Yeah, nice. I've got a shit ton of Nebbiolo. I yeah, need something yeah. to I need something to eat with it. It's Absolutely. Great. On that, best pairing for Nebbiolo, in your opinion? Actually, you being that, someone who likes food, g- genuinely, I would actually say one of my favourite is a really good quality. If, if if you can get it in Australia, hunk of hunk of parmesan, just literally <laughs> hack it off. And, yeah. It, it actually really works really well. That and earthy things, so kind of the classic mushroom yeah. risotto and stuff, I reckon works really well. Um, so yeah, those, those are kind of go definitely on on that sort of side. Yeah, um, I'm really into charcuterie, cured meaty, porky goodness with rosé at mm-hmm. the moment. Have for a little while. I think that's a, that's a real. Mm. We need to do more of that. We're getting a bit a bit of a, a rosé wave over the last few years. I've noticed. Sorry, buddy. Mm. Mm. A lot, lot more people are drinking rosé. We've, we've, we've hacked into a few of your bottles and they're dangerous because... They're really dangerous, aren't they? You, yeah. You, you do one and you go, oh, well, that didn't touch the size. Let's, let's go again. <laughs> yeah. Where's the straw? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I know. Were you it's... watching us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It, it, it is a bit like that, isn't it? And that's why I, it's so weird that it's taking us so long to kind of really catch on to why it's a bloody good drink for Australia. It's big in England, isn't it, Rosé? Massive. Maybe you guys brought it over. Yeah. Like made it popular over here. Well, the, mate, that Provence 
thing you're going to doing. That's that's going to be awesome for that. Yeah, look, very very much so. They different style of rosé though, so it'll be interesting how the Aussies go because it's it's a typically a dry rosé from Provence. Is that right? Well, it, technically it is drier, but if you actually know, <laughs> most of them have about six to 10, 12, 14 grams of, sh- of residual sugar in them. So actually, they're we believe them to be sweet, but they're quite a, a, per- a perception of dryness. But right. actually, they're very drinkable and enjoyable because they actually have a little bit of sugar in them. Yeah. Um, but you wouldn't call them off dry, even though technically they probably are, but um, mm-hmm. it's quite interesting. Yeah, no, it's, um, I benchmarked a lot of rosé for a couple of projects and um, you'd be surprised how much sugar's in, in quite a lot of them. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's what makes them enjoyable. Yeah. You know, really sort of, on a better word, smashable. Um, they are those <laughs> sort of things that you kind of, you crack open and like, oh, yeah, I'll have another bottle of that. Yeah. But um, yeah, no, it's good. It's um, amazing when you sort of consider we have such good good rosé occasions in Australia, drinking occasions, you know, mm. the classic barbecue, the getting together, the outside lifestyle, down the park, you know. I mean, it's sort of... Down the park? <laughs> <laughs> From a paper cup? Do you not go down the park? And, yeah. No? And sweet Smash cups. a bottle of wine. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do know Co- some mother's groups that have, that have those kind of coffee cups, yeah, yeah. but they put wine in them. I'm should, not going to name names. Should be targeting them. Interesting, <laughs> interesting. Yeah, target well, mothers I, groups. I've got, I've got, I've got a child on the way. First one, and uh, I, I need to find out some some names. I recommend them to uh, as my partner. She'll so appreciate go. that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe Provence is a nice razor, uh, yeah. a nice name. Yeah, Provence. <laughs> can you can you shout it's, that from the back? Provence, where are you? <laughs> Get to yeah. bed. Could be a little yeah. stri- strippery though, yeah. don't you think? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like the name Chelsea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. Um, yeah, but yeah, super drinkable, perfect for our kind of, you know, outside sort of lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it's really, really growing crazy at, um, at the moment. And um, I've had a couple of big retailers trying to get the rosé on board um, and I don't have enough of it. It's really annoying. Um, That's good, man. You, you know, create create the demand for it. That's good. Look, it's good. It's, it's a small, small rum sort of wine. That was uh, Grenache and Sangiovese, both from, both from Heathcote, same vineyard. Um, and it looked really cool. I was really pleased with how that came out. Bit of barrel fermentation, the texture, and it's you know. But again, I wanted to make a wine that had character, but equally it was just really enjoyable to sort of drink. Um, but yeah, sort of rosé, kind of the classic is is Provence, <clears throat> and um, that's that sort of that dry, really light in colour. People pick it by colour. Um, I know when we sort of last met, I was sort of going to probably mentioned you know you get back to UK pub and you know they have three or four rosés and you pick them by colour, mm. you know, from super light to sort of bright pink. And um, we're starting to go a bit more that kind of way. Um, but the cost of Provence Rosé is, is, pretty, is pretty high. And they know that, um, having spoken to the association recently, and they are pushing it as a premium product, as they, as they sort of should. Um, but Australia's most sold rosé is actually from the Loire. It's a rosé d'Anjou. Um, and that's, uh, that's actually sold through um, Dan Murphy's and, and DWS. One, one of theirs, and the amount of that they sell is phenomenal, crazy. Can you break it down um, to state as well? I mean, so a New South Wales drinking more rosé or a Queensland, because is it driven by climate, I guess, is, is the question. Yeah, <laughs> I'll be honest, I've actually been trying to get hold of that data at mm. the moment, and um, I, I haven't seen it as yet, so I would love to know, but you would certainly think so. Um I mean, it's got to suit Queensland, right? I mean, Brisbane, and I mean, well, even just even just by sort of personal experience, you go up to Noosa, and everyone's drinking yeah. Provence Rosé, yeah. And there's like two kinds they've got up there, and they're, they're local guys that are importing it. And I can't see Rosé overtaking Forex in Queensland. <laughs> <laughs> and that's right. Again, we're sort of talking about you know what we consider, yeah, kind of demographics and people we might know, right? And yeah, yeah, you're right. It, it probably it probably won't. Yeah. Or Bundy and Coke, you know. The, the only classic. T- yeah. Classic. The yeah. only time I have four X, I'll be honest with you, is when I go to the Breakfast Creek Hotel in Queensland. Normally catching up with with a family up there. I go to the Breakfast Creek Hotel and they do four X off the barrel. They call it off the wood. And it's it's a good beer. Off it's, the barrel? Yeah. Really? Yeah, it's that's the only time it's I've the first time I've ever heard that. So yeah. it's, well it's the, it's the only time I want to admit it. Yeah, just <laughs> just on air to on everyone. Air to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So on that, talk us about the food pairing because I've even seen that the lines are getting a bit more murky there. You know, the, the traditional you would have fish and white, you know, but now mm. people are now starting to get a bit more adventurous. Certainly mm. when you go to some of the fine dining places and they, I've noticed on menus they're kind of going, oh, you should have this and then this is the wine we, we would suggest you have with it. And it's not always that 
you know, red wine, red meat, red wine, white white meat, white wine. It, it's yeah, blurring not, a bit. Not quite as obvious. Yeah, that's kind of true. The big one that I've seen a lot at the moment is, um, which is a really obvious one, and I'm sort of struggling to break it myself, is not going for reds with cheese, but whites with cheese. It's a much better combination. Much really? Much, mm, much, much better. Um, things like some of the amber wines, you know, talking about the, the, orange, the orange wines, again, some of those go incredibly well with those, uh, you know, sort of that sort of white bloomy kind of cabinet, um, uh, brie type mm. type sort of wines. Uh, Jesus, really, really kind of uh, cool. But yeah, no, there is there is a real sort of move to that. But there's also a shift away, not necessarily from wine as well, mm. um, which is you know sort of I think incredibly valid. Um, sake is a great example. I think keeping it on the booze tip. Mm. I love the stuff. It's great, and that has just. Yeah. Do you it's like grappa? A... I've had some good nights on it. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure I like it. <laughs> um, and I've had some really good quality ones, yeah. and I'm still not 100% yeah. salt. It's pretty, yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, pokey in them. Yeah. Where's the place we went? Yeah. Romano Levi in Barbaresco. That was that was pretty oh, good. Oh, really? That was, he made his. It was quite fascinating because cool. he makes his quite differently, doesn't he? Yeah. Well, he's the the only the only grappa maker or the only still in the world that still uses the tradi- traditional method. So, in other words, they have a ceremony for the lighting of the flame. So, once okay. they light the flame, they use that flame for the whole season of making grappa. And what they do is um, they grow all the fruit there. They use the fruit, obviously press it, put it into blocks um, as they're pressing it. Yep. take out the, the juice, distill it, but then they use the grape skins that they've pressed as fuel uh, for the actual still as well. Uh-huh, okay. And then after after that's burnt, they use the ash from the back of the still. They've got water pipes that run all along the ground and yeah. they put the ash onto the water pipes and it heats up the house as well. So it's complete. How cool is yeah. that? It was it was quite special to check well, out. That is awesome. I, yeah, I, I love that. I wasn't a massive fan of the grapper because a bit like you – yeah, you, you, you tend to be for one reason, but you were yeah. frothing a bit. Weren't I you? was crying. It was, <laughs> it was <laughs> probably one of the moments. best. It really was. <laughs> yeah. it, was it was probably one of the best moments of my life. <laughs> I, I had, I it. think we had eight grappa, eight grappi, sorry, um, and everyone was absolutely fantastic. Yeah, you saw pictures of Pavarotti, um, Berlusconi, like all just big sort of yeah, Italian. Right. How cool is that? Italian people like on the wall, all plastered all over the wall. Like you'd you drive past this place, you wouldn't know it was there. It looks like an absolute yeah. barn, but that's where all of the best, like the richest people in Italy, get their grappa from. And yeah. it was just such an amazing experience as well. They didn't speak a lick of English, so oh really? So John was in his element. But <laughs> people be top of the uppy. I blended in, mate. You, I, mean, I was going to say you, you are fluent in yeah. so many well, so many cultures. Fluent in bullshit. <laughs> <I think. laughs> yeah, definitely that. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Can you get that over here? Uh, you can, but it's extremely expensive. I'm trying to find an importer. So if anyone hears this that knows who imports Romano Levi, um, we'll have yeah. a chat. We'll have a chat later. I'm sure yeah. we can uh, we can find out who's who's doing it. I've, I know I know a few of the guys that are doing that stuff. Nice. Um, a little bit different to that to, to, to the to the grappi is um, the Amaros that I've really oh. got into. Now that I'm such a big fan of, and again, we we're starting because we have you know such a good Italian mm. sort of link up here in Australia. Yeah. We have some pretty good good selections. But again, you go over there and these random things that start popping out. Yeah, big they time. are amazing. Yeah, like Amari or Amaro, I'm really, really big on. I quite like that as well. What, Same it, if, what is it? Well, it means bitter. So it's like, like a digestive that you have after dinner. It's a bit like, you know, I mean, the classics are sort of, well, Campari is pretty damn sweet, but Campari, the vermouths and those sort of ones. But then you get a, a Verna, you have. Averna, um, yeah. Montenegro. Montenegro is a great one. Uh, Nonino, there's uh, quite yeah. a few. Uh, the Sinar, which is made from artichokes. Yeah, China, yeah. China, there you go. That's horrible, that stuff. <laughs> I, quite, I quite like that one. Yeah. This that good. one, oh, that's a strong flavour. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give you some. Actually, do you know what? It's the only thing that makes Coke taste palatable. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, the drink. It's, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for clearing that up. <laughs> yeah, no, seriously. It's, uh, so you, actually, you have Amaro with, yeah, with, I had it, with a um, can of Coke? I think, where did I have it? Someone's, um, oh, I had one of the little... Um, places around here anyway and it was um yeah it was really good yeah i say really good maybe i'm making it up maybe i had a few too many yeah. but anyway i was quite surprised yeah. like yeah really I'm right okay cool no it was, it was pretty cool i'm gonna do that straight away <laughs> give it a crack see what yeah, you think definitely. yeah yeah so, so is it always an after drink or is it, a, is no. it a, can you pre-drink it as well well can you drink alcohol in the morning 
you know, there's no real laws. No. Well, it depends on what time zone yeah. you're, you're, you're pairing up to, eh? Yeah, mm. like you have it after dinner. It does help, you know, sort of relax a bit, like your stomach, especially with the amount we eat. And, uh, well, <laughs> it's like Ferno, Ferno Branca. Yeah. That, yeah. that genuinely so, makes... Fernand Branca is... Oh, it's actually, is, it should be prescribed. Yeah. <laughs> I've, I'm not... I, I shit you not. It is incredible. I was, I was that was the one I was trying to think of. That is... Worst. I see. I yeah. Of course, I'm a huge fan of the flavor, but I'm sort of kind of kind of like you kind of love yeah, to hate it. Yeah. You know? But I, I was yeah. I once had a kind of completely overrate, and mm. yeah, you feel ugh, totally totally horrible about it. And um, and someone said you need one of these, you'll feel better. Mm. Oh my god, the last thing I want to do is drink anything alcoholic at the moment. But okay. <laughs> Oof. And no joke. Twenty minutes later, I was like, I actually feel like a million times better. Yeah, it really it, does work. Seriously good. Mm. Yeah, I, I, incredible stuff. Mm. Really herbally, very, very bitter. It genuinely is not particularly pleasant to drink mm. unless you start developing a bit of a flavour for it. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, which I, know, I know a couple of guys actually that have. But yeah, really, really cool stuff. Mm. Is that the stuff we had the other night in Canberra? Negative. Uh, we had non Nino Amaro. Right, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Good one. Yeah. It's, so they all made from artichokes? Nah. No, 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 no. no. Um, okay. I don't know what they're made of, all of them, but... A lot, a, lot, a lot of them are sort of vermouthy things, so they mm. sort of use wine, sugar bases, and then add kind of effectively botanicals in, but, mm. without, but without the distilling part. Of right. Gym. Mm. Okay. Mm. So I'm going to put you on the spot here. Mm. You have got a booking table for four in somewhere in Sydney. Who would be the three people you'd want to dine with? They don't have to be from the wine industry, but if they could be, the Ooh. booze industry, <laughs> they could be celebrities, who would it be? This is really putting me on the spot. This is not scripted, this one. Uh, yeah. No. I, I, I literally <laughs> just thought of it. I, I, had, I, had a, I had a sneaky suspicion that might might be the case. Uh, Let's help you. Let's say they're from the wine industry. So they could be a sommelier, they could be a winemaker. Blimey. You really have put me on the spot, mate. Should we play some hold music while you're thinking? <laughs> I, do have that. Um, I would probably go with I don't know, with my someone like Dave Fletcher, Aussie making uh, Chiretto over in over in, in love Rolo. his wine. That Fletcher wines, yeah. yeah, cool wines. Seems like a cool guy. Don't know him personally, but I think he'd be good to you know steal his information basically. Mm. Uh, but he seems like a cool guy. He's doing cool stuff, um, and I like the idea of making a jump, you know, to to Italy and mm. just just from a cultural standpoint, you know, like how difficult it is and different culture. That'd be quite kind of cool. Um, I would. Should I think who else I'd try and pick? Yeah. I wouldn't mind probably, was it Gary Far, one of the, the far, far, far rising dudes? Those those guys are making yeah. some really mm. cool wines. They're yeah. down in, they're Sorenberg, aren't they? Um, they just, Geelongy yeah. area around that way. And between sort of father and son, they've made some really cool sort of wines that are both very traditional in, in sort of conventional, but yeah. they also have kind of pushed the... Yeah, pushed it out a bit on a few things, and I think that would be really interesting to sort of know. Um, and then the other guy, actually, I probably would want to get because he's a really cool, cool dude, is uh, Pierre Cotton from Beaujolais. Right, there you go. A friend of mine imports his wines over here. Um, yeah, they are, oof, honestly, mm. they're sometimes cool. Sauvignon Blanc, uh, slut juice. Well, his, his Beaujolais is. is is a, is, a, is a wine dude's uh, slut juice. It is incredible. It's such good wine. All right, I'm after to get a case of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I can, yeah. Put, I do, I, I can sort I do you do out like with that. I do like really, a Beaujolais. Really, really good. They're just incredible sort of texture and he's a really young guy and he's sort of come at it from um, sort of inheriting his his, uh, his father's uh, vineyards and he's sort of grown them and gone sort of fully kind of biodynamic, um, which much many of them do, but he makes just really interesting characterful wines. There you go. Love them. Mm. There you go. Well... David, I think we've taken up enough of your time. We've now sunk the Sab Blanc. I don't think we can crack open the other four, but I will do when everybody <laughs> goes. Yeah. Thank you very much for joining us on Lifestyle Thanks, Pirates. David. Pleasure. Um, mate, how can people get hold of you? Are you on the gram? Are you on Facebook? Uh, all of those fine social channels. Yep, yep we are all, all of those. Uh, yep, we can, you can buy wines directly off the, the website, bornandraisedwines.com.au. Lovely. Um, and you can find them in a number of little independent bottle shops. Uh, yeah, and... Uh, me perfect thanks for coming on thanks pleasure gentlemen always good enjoy thanks